Hello and welcome to the Anglo-Saxons in their own words. My name is Danny. Today we're going to be reading another of Bede's famous stories. However, this story does not concern any saints or even the church. Rather, we're going to be talking about the origins of Anglo-Saxon Britain and how these Germanic peoples came to the island. Now what I'm looking forward to most in this episode is that we're not getting this account secondhand. So put the textbooks, doctoral research, and archaeological record to the side, because we're going to be getting this story from the horse's mouth, from the Anglo-Saxons themselves. So, besides what you may already know about the period, and what evidence may or may not exist for an Anglo-Saxon invasion of Britain, it'll be interesting to hear their version of events. So let's just jump right in and hear what Bede has to say. Here we go. Chapter 15. How the Angles, being invited into Britain, at first drove off the enemy, but not long after, making a league with them, turned their weapons against their allies. In the year of our Lord, 449, Marcion, the 46th from Augustus, being made emperor with Valentinian, ruled the empire seven years. Then, the nation of the Angles, or Saxons, being invited by the aforesaid king, arrived in Britain with three ships of war, and had a place in which to settle assigned to them by the same king, in the eastern part of the island, on the pretext of fighting in defense of their country whilst their real intentions were to conquer it. Accordingly, they engaged with the enemy, who were come from the north to give battle, and the Saxons obtained the victory. When the news of their success and of the fertility of the country and the cowardice of the Britons reached their own home, a more considerable fleet was quickly sent over, bringing a greater number of men, and these, being added to the former army, made up an invincible force. The newcomers received of the Britons a place to inhabit among them, upon condition that they should wage war against their enemies for the peace and security of the country, whilst the Britons agreed to furnish them with pay. Those who came over were of the three most powerful nations of Germany, Saxons, Angles, and Jutes. From the Jutes are descended the people of Kent, and of the Isle of Wight, including those in the province of the West Saxons, who are to this day called Jutes, seated opposite to the Isle of Wight. From the Saxons, that is the country which is now called Old Saxony, came the East Saxons, the South Saxons, and the West Saxons. From the Angles, that is the country which is called Angulus, and which is said from that time to have remained desert to this day. Between the provinces of the Jutes and the Saxons are descended the East Angles, the Midland Angles, the Mercians, all the race of the Northumbrians, that is, of those nations that dwell on the north side of the river Humber and the other nations of the Angles. The first commanders are said to be the brothers Hengist and Horsa. Of these, Horsa was afterwards slain in battle by the Britons, and a monument bearing his name is still in existence in the eastern parts of Kent. They were the sons of Victgilsus, whose father was Vita, son of Vecta, son of Woden, from whose stock the royal race of many provinces traced their descent. In a short time, swarms of the aforesaid nations came over into the island, and the foreigners began to increase so much that they became a source of terror to the natives themselves who had invited them. Then, having on a sudden entered into league with the Picts, whom they had by this time repelled by force of arms, they began to turn their weapons against their allies. At first, they obliged them to furnish them a greater quantity of provisions, and, seeking an occasion of quarrel, protested that unless more plentiful supplies were brought them, they would break the league and ravage all the island nor were they backward in putting their threats into execution. In short, the fire kindled by the hands of the pagans proved God's just vengeance for the crimes of the people, not unlike that which, being of old lighted by the Chaldeans, consumed the walls and all the buildings of Jerusalem. For here too, through the agency of the pitiless conqueror, yet by the disposal of the just judge, it ravaged all the neighboring cities and country, spreading the conflagration from the eastern to the western sea, without any opposition, and overran the whole face of the doomed island. Public as well as private buildings were overturned. The priests were everywhere slain before the altars. No respect was shown for office. The prelates with the people were destroyed with fire and sword, nor were there any left to bury those who had been thus cruelly slaughtered. Some of the miserable remnant, being taken in the mountains, were butchered in heaps. Others, spent with hunger, came forth and submitted themselves to the enemy to undergo for the sake of food perpetual servitude if they were not killed upon the spot. Some, with sorrowful hearts, fled beyond the seas. Others, remaining in their own country, 
led a miserable life of terror and anxiety of mind among the mountains, woods, and crags. All right, so it sounds like the British are in pretty rough shape after the Germans come to town. And it sounds like they fell for the oldest trick in the book, which is to pay people to kill for you until those same people realize they could just kill you and take all your money. Now, naturally the question that arises is, why would the British pay someone else to do the fighting? Well, we have to remember here, Rome had professional soldiers, but the legions had long gone from Britain, meaning most of those remaining in Britain likely had little training about defenses and battle tactics. Barring probably some retired legionaries, those who were left were civilians. Archaeological evidence suggests that this was especially the case in the southern end of Britain, where the richest of the Romano-British lived. Now, when the Saxons supposedly turned on their bosses, though, we do get glimpses of the Britons fighting back, and even having some success. Bede goes on in chapter 16 to talk about Ambrosius Aurelianus, a man of, quote, royal race, who helped lead the Britons to victory at Baden Hill. It's largely believed that Ambrosius is the inspiration for the tale of King Arthur. Rome at this time regularly used barbarians for defense, and Britain was no exception to the rule. If you can't do the job yourself, pay someone else to do it. Now, very interestingly, if we jump back slightly, Bede tells us in chapter 14 that after the Romans left, quote, evil living increased, and this was immediately attended by the taint of all manner of crime. Whereupon, not long after, a more severe vengeance for their fearful crimes fell upon the nation. End quote. I would take this piece from Bede to say that we can assume Roman law was no longer being upheld in Britain at this point, at least not effectively. And yet, at the same time, some form of organization is obvious, as somebody had to be facilitating the payment of the mercenaries. Rome wasn't built in a day, and though the empire did unravel comparatively quickly, the structures it left behind in Britain didn't fall apart in a day either. For about a generation, most of the Romano-British would have hoped or even expected a return to the empire. Britain, after all, had bounced in and out before, following various rebellions and trouble on the continent, so at least for a time, many Britons would have expected to be brought back into the Roman fold. Ironically, Bede justifies the savagery, for lack of a better word, of his own people in testifying that it was God's will that the Britons should be punished at the hands of the Anglo-Saxon invaders. As we've already mentioned, religion informed all aspects of Anglo-Saxon life, including their history. And this idea that the Britons were being punished for their sins completely coincides with biblical narratives. For example, every time the Israelites in the Bible were invaded or taken captive, it was almost always a result of having sinned and turned from God. Bede even invokes a biblical reference to the Chaldeans in this chapter. So logically, from Bede's perspective, the same should apply here. When the people are sinful, God sends his punishers. Only in this case, it was the Anglo-Saxons. Now you might be thinking, the Anglo-Saxons were pagan at this point, not Christian. So how could they possibly punish the Britons for their sins? Well, in the Bible too, God often uses pagan tribes to punish Israel. So Bede would find little issue with this idea. Additionally, in Higgum and Ryan's Anglo-Saxon world, they remind us that Bede is writing in 8th century Northumbria an Anglo-Saxon kingdom that is suffering territorial losses. There was no such thing as coincidence for the Anglo-Saxons. Events were the result of providence, God's divine hand. So Bede is telling the tale of the Anglo-Saxon invasion in religious terms, and he's warning his own people of what happens when you do not follow God's teaching. Even when the Britons are victorious in battle, like at Mount Baden, Bede attributes their success to their faith. Okay. Now let's turn to another of our sources, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and see what it has to say about how the Anglo-Saxons came to Britain. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle was compiled on the orders of King Alfred the Great of Wessex around 890 AD, but continued to be updated by unknown scribes until the middle of the 12th century. Unlike Bede's history, the language of this composition is Old English. The Chronicle, as you might have guessed from the title, is arranged chronologically, and each entry is dated. The account we have in this source for the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons in Britain is dated at AD 449, and though it largely mirrors Bede's account, we do have some differences. Let's listen in. AD 449 This year, Marcian and Valentinian assumed the empire and reigned seven winters. 
In their days, Hengist and Horsa, invited by Wurtgern, king of the Britons, to his assistance, landed in Britain in a place that is called Ipwinis Fleet. First of all, to support the Britons, but afterwards fought against them. The king directed them to fight against the Picts, and they did so, and obtained the victory wheresoever they came. They then sent to the Angles, and desired them to send more assistance. They described the worthlessness of the Britons, and the richness of the land. They then sent them greater support. Then came the men from the three powers of Germany, the old Saxons, the Angles, and the Jutes. From the Jutes are descended the men of Kent, White Warians, that is, the tribe that now dwelleth in the Isle of Wight, and that kindred in Wessex that men yet call the kindred of the Jutes. From the old Saxons came the people of Essex and Sussex and Wessex. From Anglia, which has ever since remained waste between the Jutes and Saxons, came the East Angles, the Middle Angles, and Mercians, and all those of north of the Humber. Their leaders were two brothers, Hengist and Horsa, who were the sons of Whitgills. Whitgills was the son of Witta, Witta of Wecta, Wecta of Woden. From this Woden arose all our royal kindred, and that of the Southumbrians also. AD 455. This year, Hengist and Horsa fought with Wurtgern the king on the spot called Aylesford. His brother Horsa being there slain, Hengist afterwards took to the kingdom with his son Esk. AD 457. This year, Hengist and Esk fought with the Britons on the spot that is called Crayford, and there slew 4,000 men. The Britons then forsook the land of Kent, and in great consternation fled to London. Now, it's not until 20 years later that we hear of more Anglo-Saxons coming to Britain, in AD 477. The Chronicle records, quote, This year came Ayla to Britain with his three sons, Chimon and Blanking and Chissa, in three ships, landing at a place that is called Chiminshore. Then again, another 20 years, and we have a record of more arrivals, in AD 495. Quote, this year came two leaders into Britain, Churdich and Chinrich, his son, with five ships at a place that is called Churdich's Oar. Finally, we have these last two entries documenting more arrivals, in AD 501 and AD 514, respectively. Quote, this year, Porta and his two sons, Beda and Mila, came into Britain with two ships at a place called Portsmouth. They soon landed and slew on the spot a young Briton of very high rank. And in 514. This year came the West Saxons into Britain, with three ships at a place that is called Churdich's Oar, and Stuff and Whitgar fought with the Britons and put them to flight. So there you have it. That is the story of how the Anglo-Saxons came to live in Britain, directly from two of our best source materials on the period. We hear of how the Britons paid the Anglo-Saxons initially for their protection, but how these Germanic peoples eventually turned on their employers. We also get the dates for the arrival of some of the founding fathers of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, and hear about some of their victories against the British. So what did you think of these stories? Is it easy to believe in an Anglo-Saxon invasion after hearing this? It seems like we certainly had a lot of fighting going on for territory. Do you think the Britons were being punished? Was there more they could have done? Let me know what you think. You can send your questions, comments, or concerns to the Anglo Saxon Podcast at gmail.com. That's it for today's episode, guys. So thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode. 